Um, and then without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our next speak speaker. Um, so Dr. Uh, Ahana Fernandez is a postdoctoral researcher at the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Uh, she's also a postdoc um, fellow at the Smithsonian um, Research Institute. Um, she is a behavioral biologist fascinated by social vocal communications in bats. Um, and in particular, her research focuses on investigating proximate me mechanisms for vocal production of learning and exploring um, vocal ontogenic processes. So in addition, she started her ed to educate herself on neuroethnology, um, ethology, sorry. Um, so this is the study of speech related to genes and their function, a uh, functional role in um, vocal learning processes. So I'm absolutely delighted. And I'm sure you might have seen on Twitter, there's been a lot of um, uh, the research has been going around. And um, so do definitely look up more information on this, but I'm very happy to hand over um, to Ahana, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for this nice introduction and thank you everyone for joining me today. I will share my presentation. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm very delighted to uh, be invited to give a, a talk at this uh, wonderful webinar series here. And I'm going to talk about social vocal communication in bats and in particular in the greater sacwing bat. So I think we in this round all agree that bats are fascinating mammals with astounding sensory and cognitive abilities. And this is, for example, demonstrated in the marvelous auditory processing skills of the brown long ear bat here in the corner up here. I don't know if you see my mouse. Um, this bat species, thanks to the skills, can find its prey even in dense vegetation. Um, it is demonstrated in the frog eating bat here that is a neotropical bat species, especially uh, studied in Panama, that it can integrate multisensory information to find its prey. But it's also demonstrated in nectarivorous bats that evolved ultraviolet vision in order to find the flowers that they are feeding from. It is demonstrated in frugivorous bats down here in the left corner that evolved um, special olfactory receptor patterns in order to find their fruits. It is um, demonstrated in a fishing bat who is able to find its prey um, based on the ripples that the prey is producing on the water. And also in a common vampire bat that evolved infrared um, uh, sensing and thermoception in order to be able to feed on blood. So all of these astounding cognitive abilities are, are really, really impressive, and they are well suited for the, each ecological niche in which the bat species is living in. But what I find most intriguing about bats is actually that they perceive the world in a completely other way than we humans do. They see the world through their ears. And I think everybody here in this public knows that bats use echolocation calls for navigation, orientation, and foraging. And um, when I talk to people who are not knowledgeable about bats or not as much as we are, I sometimes get the question, but how do they produce the sounds? And then I always give the answer, well, bats as mammals use the same sound source as we humans do. They have a larynx to produce sounds. And then they can emit their vocalizations either through the nose or through the mouth. And what I find really interesting is that each call is under active neuromuscular control. And this is quite impressive if you think about the high rate at which bats have to call sometimes in, in different contexts, especially when they are foraging. And I think that in our minds, we still have this perception that echolocation calls are quite fixed. They don't have so many degrees of freedom, but uh, studies are showing that this is not quite true, right? So bats can quite flexibly adjust different parameters of their echolocation calls, like temporal parameters, but also um, uh, spectral parameters to avoid, for example, overlapping with echolocation calls of con or heterospecifics during foraging or when they are encountering noise. So it is, is quite a dynamic system, actually. Echolocation calls are naturally selected, and as I said before, they are mainly for orientation. However, they can also encode social information like, for example, individual signatures, population affiliation, or sex signatures. 
So what I want you to keep in mind here is that echolocation calls actually show a very high vocal, a uh, high plasticity. And the underlying mechanisms, this fine tuned control over your vocal apparatus and your auditory processing system is actually also a good prerequisite for complex social communication. And that's basically what is the most interesting and most fascinating to me, the social communication in bats. So what information do they encode in their vocalizations? Um, when do they share it? In which context? How do they learn this social communication? Because I think studying the communication between individuals also allows me to open a little window into their cognitive worlds. And that's what interests me most. So social communication is um, broadly speaking, um, combined or composed of two, two broad categories. We have the social calls. These are naturally or sexually selected uh, vocalizations. They are kind of simple in structure. As you can see here, this is a spectrogram of uh, isolation call of the pub of Plecotus auditus. So isolation call has the function to elicit maternal care. And um, of course, although it is a simple structure, it can encode a lot of information. So for example, individual signatures, but also group affiliation or age, for example. Another um, example of calls are contact calls. They're also very well known and researched. And a marvelous example that I want to share here is the contact calls of Theroptera tricolor. These are um, disc winged bats also from Southern America and um, Panama and Costa Rica. And my friend, Laura Chaveri, she's a professor in Costa Rica. She is working on that system and she has been studying the communication of these bats for, for decades now. And she actually found that they have a very interesting contact call system. So they have an inquiry and response call. And these calls um, are used by the bats when they fly together to, to keep or maintain cohesion, but also to find suitable roosts. So these bats roost in those um, tubular leaves that you can see here. It's also why they have, instead of uh, thumbs, they have discs and they can adhere to this to this tubes, these leaf tubes here. So um, as you can probably imagine, these leaves won't be there for weeks, right? After a, a couple of days, they, are, they open and they have to find new leaves again to find shelter during the day. So what happens is that one bat finds a tube, goes into, inside the tube, and then it will start to produce response call when it hears the inquiry calls of other, speech, uh, of other group members. And then the bats will fly into the tube and find shelter. So this is a short video. You will see it's very quick. So you have to be, you have to concentrate actually. So you have the first bat goes into the tube, starts to produce this response call. The second one hears it and flies into that tube. And that's how this response call looks like. This is a contact call. And um, as many contact calls, the information encoded here is um, individual and group signatures. So in this tube, the um, the group signature, or in, in this bad species, this group signature is, is helping actually that always only group members will find themselves in the same tube. And in general, also in other species, contact calls can help in coordination of group activities. The other second big category in social communication is actually, actually song. And song is a sexually selected signal and it has a complex structure, meaning that you have at least two elements or syllables that are then composed into a sequence or a motif. So here I brought you this wonderful example of a song of an African bat species, which you can see here down here. And even without measuring anything, you can recognize or appreciate that there are different elements and syllables that are combined into a sequence. Song is used in territorial defense and courtship. And of course, it can also carry a lot of information like individual signatures, but also group signatures or information about quality of the emitter of the song. So I have explained to you why I like to study social communication um, in general, but why exactly in bats? So I think Bats are a suitable taxon because we have so many species worldwide, and this is a perfect 
um, possibility to study um, vocal communication in a comparative approach across species and compare different communication systems. As I said before, the bats have highly specialized auditory and vocal modalities, meaning that we can study the underlying mechanisms that are necessary for um, the evolution of such highly specialized uh, systems. And then one point which is especially important for me is that we have this huge diversity of social systems in bats, right? We have bats that live in monogamous groups and small perennial groups, but we have bats that have to cope with fission fusion dynamics. And this diversity in social systems is mirrored in their vocal diversity, right? We have bats that have rather small repertoires, but we have bats that have large repertoires and they combine their syllables into multisyllabic vocalization and song. And something which interests me very much is also the question how sociality influences actually the evolution of complex vocal communication, but also complex vocal learning. And I think, again, bats are very promising to to study that. And then one point which we tend to forget sometimes is that bats as mammals share the same brain architecture as we humans do. And this of course is um, a perfect opportunity to study the neuronal substrate, substrates, the genes, the molecular um, substrates of vocal communication and in particular of vocal learning. So um, one field that I'm also interested in is the so-called biolinguistic research field, meaning that you are looking into biological foundations of complex vocal communication like syntax or vocal learning or speech production. Um, and I think bats are a very promising taxon to study exactly these biological foundations of complex vocal communication systems. And one of these factors which are very important for uh, vocal complex vocal communication is the capability, the cognitive trait of vocal produ production learning. And you can imagine vocal production learning as a continuum with different levels. Um, so you have the most basic level, which is down here. And this is basically when you have an innate vocalization and then you can change certain parameters of this innate vocalization based on the social environment. Um, um, let's say higher level of vocal production learning is the so-called vocal imitation, which is found here, meaning that you need auditory input and you learn a new vocalization from scratch, but it is a species specific vocalization. So typical examples are for example, of our songbirds, right? That they, they hear the song from an adult male tutor and then the pupil learns to produce and imitate and learn this song. And then um, the highest level of vocal production learning is the ability to not only imitate species-specific vocalizations or sounds, but also heterospecific signals. So think of parrots that can imitate human speech or dolphins that can imitate artificial signals. And of course, we humans, we can learn second, third, fourth languages, even when we're adults. And we can also imitate all kinds of sounds when you think about beatboxing, for example. And this vocal imitation ability is also absolutely crucial for us humans because we need that when we acquire speech as infants. In bats, there are different studies showing that uh, we have different um, vocal production um, learning levels. So in most case, cases, um, studies have shown vocal convergence both in pups, but also in adult bats mostly in social calls, like contact calls, for example, but also in um, echolocation calls down here in the greater horseshoe bat. And so far, the only species that I'm aware of that um, has been demonstrated to be able of vocal imitation and not only calls, but song is the greater sackling bat. And um, now I would like to focus on this bat species. And I have been lucky enough to work with this bat since I think eight years now or nine years. And it is uh, the most amazing bat species um, that I have encountered so far. It is a small insectivorous neotropical bat species. Um, it is distributed from Mexico to Brazil. And it is a typical forest edge forager. And the day roosts this bat species chooses are either on the outside of big, large trees, so in the tree crevices, 
but the species also really, really likes man-made man -made structures. So you find them, for example, in abandoned building like this bunker down here. This was taken in Panama, this photo, or they even like to roost outside of inhabited buildings like this uh, little colony up here in a corner of a um, lab building, actually. And all the work that I'm going to present you right now, and especially the questions that I was allowed to ask during my PhD, and I was allowed to find answers to these questions, were only possible because my work is based on previous work from, from other people that have been working with the same species for decades. And I think this really shows that long-term data matters if you really want to ask in-depth questions about behavior and communication. So much of the work which I'm going to present is also grounded and related to the work of my former PhD supervisor, Miriam Knernschild, and her postdoc, Martina Nagy. So, I brought you a video of a typical day roost of Sacopteryx pilliniata. So this is a very light tolerant species. You have probably anticipated that from the photos I showed you of the, of the day roosts. Um, these bat species um, live in a stable perennial groups. So they stay together for several years. And what is very unique about this species is that they have this very special roosting pattern, which you can see here probably very well. So this, these are adult bats. They have a little bit lighter fur and they have this inter-individual distance that they maintain all the time. And if this inter-individual distance is ignored by an adult bat, it will be re-established through harsh vocalizations and also through, through different behavioral displays. So the only ones that are allowed to ignore that distance are actually the pups. And we know also that the adult bats have like preferred spots in their um, day roosts where they tend to roost every day. And we know that because we uh, banned the, the bats individually. And maybe again, just to show you, um, the, bat, the bat pups are recognizable by their darker fur. So this is a typical posture of a pup, which is attached to the, the belly of the mother. And when they are older, we'll talk about this later, the, the females will shake them off and then the pups are allowed to explore and to crawl around and fly around in this day roost. It's a little bit like, like a kindergarten. So the pups really can do everything. They can also ignore this, this inter individual distance. They can approach each adult bat and they will, yeah they're just free to play around. So what is most fascinating for me is that uh, the greater sacrament bat is a highly vocal species. It possesses a large vocal repertoire um, containing many different syllable types, which are then combined into multisyllabic vocalizations and two song types. So we have the territorial song and the courtship song. And first I would like you to focus on the territorial song down here. So here you see a spectrogram of a complete song. Um, it is composed of many different syllable types. And we are going to, to have a look at this song type a little bit closer later during my talk. And here you see the song syllables of the courtship song. Please be aware that this is not the actual sequence um, nor a complete courtship song. I just wanted to display you the variability of syllable types that are present during courting and produced by males. And this courtship behavior is basically also a very interesting behavior. It is multimodal because the male will combine um, vocalizations with a behavioral display and with order. So in this video, which I'm going to play, you will see um, a female. The female is sitting here. And in Sacopteryx pilniata, the females are larger and heavier than the males. So they really can choose with whom to mate. And this one is the male, and the male will start a typical behavioral display, which is part of the courtship behavior. So the male will hover in front of the female. It's called hovering because it looks a little bit like a colibri hovering in front of a flower. And while the bat is hovering, he will produce uh, certain syllable types of this courtship behavior. And maybe you have seen in the video, I will play it again, that sometimes the bat like drops like a little bit, right? Now it drops, drops. And this is actually when the bat is 
really folding its wings in, in front of it, like opening them completely, like sort of clapping them together. And in by doing so, the wing sacs open. And this is actually also why these bats have the name, so sac-winged bats. The males have wing pouches in their wing membrane, and the territorial males fill them with um, an individual perfume. And this perfume is like a mixture of uh, secretions from different glands and urine, and they put that in, in this uh, little wing sacs every day. Um, and additionally, in territorial adult males, the inner side of the swing set is completely white. So it is really a multimodal signal. So when the, the bat will open its wing completely, the, the female will receive this white flash of the inner side of the wing sack, and she will also smell the odor of the male, and the male is like flying in front of her and singing. Um, yeah, this is quite impressive. But um, we are going to research this courtship behavior in detail, or when I say we, it's actually our newest Sacopterix pediniata aficionata, it's Marisa Titke. She recently st started her PhD in the group where I'm a postdoc at at the moment. And um, yeah, I think in a couple of years, she can maybe give a webinar and tell more about the courtship behavior in Sacopterix pediniata. So let's circle back to the territorial song because this song is actually very well researched and understood. It is produced every morning and every evening by the territorial males. So in Sacopter Spiliniata, you have to know that the colony in a colony, you have one up to several territorial males, meaning that they occupy a territory in this, in this um, day roost. And every morning when the bats are flying in after foraging, the males are the first ones to arrive. They sit down in their territories and they will start to produce this song. And each male will then respond with its, with its song. It's kind of counter singing. And every day before they leave the roost for foraging, the same spectacle will go on. The males will start singing, repeating the territorial song over and over for about 20 minutes. And this territorial song encodes an individual signature and a group signature. So males from the same social group sounds sound more similar than males from other social groups. And um, it is also known that this territorial song uh, encodes or informs about male quality. And actually, um, this was also work from Miriam. Um, she showed that there are different dialects in this territorial song present, and that these territorial songs are not only important for males, so that they are informed there's still the other male there and he's singing and he's obviously still occupying his territory. So I'm not going to try to attack or usurp this territory. It's also important information for females because in this species, what happens is unlike very mammals, the females will disperse after weaning. So the males stay within the colony they are born um, and the females have to go and um, look for other colonies to stay. So what happens during dispersal is that females will fly around and they will check out a colony for one day and then maybe check out another colony for another day and then at the end decide where they want to stay. And for finding the colonies, they use this territorial song because in uncluttered um, environment, this territorial song, which is very low frequent, will carry, will be uh, audible in... 120 meters away from the roost. So it's like an acoustic beacon. And then the, the female will hear that song and will find a new colony. And based on the group signature in this call, in this song, she can also decide whether there are any males that somehow related to her or not. Um, and like that, the female will find a new colony. And all this work on reproductive systems and female dispersal was work done by Martina. And then um, Miriam, during her PhD, actually found out that this territorial song is the part of the adult vocal repertoire, which is learned through vocal, uh, vocal imitation. So you have the males that sing every morning, every evening, this territorial song, and the pups that are born into this colony, they will be exposed to this auditory input. They will hear that plenty of times, and then they will start at some point to learn and to imitate the syllables. And this learning process is expressed in a very conspicuous vocal practice behavior. And I brought you a video 
to show you how this vocal practice behavior looks like and how it sounds. And it is a video of a babbling excerpt. Um, it was made in a day roost because um, this vocal practice behavior is a diurnal behavior as many other behaviors as well. Here you see the female, that's um, um, an adult female with uh, rings on her forearm so that we can individually identify her and next to her is the pup. And now during the video, you also have to do uh, multi-sensory integration because you will first of all have visual information you so you will see the pup which is opening the mouth while producing those syllables you will see the syllables running in real time down here but you will actually also have auditory information because you will be hearing this vocal practice behavior because most of it is actually produced within the hearing range of humans so i hope you will hear it Yes, that's perfect. That's working. Okay. So this um, vocal practice behavior is um, takes place several times per day. And because it, when you when you listen to it, and especially if you sit in front of the bats and, and you observe this behavior, you're immediately reminded of infant uh, human babbling. So that's why it was termed pop babbling, actually. And um, as you have seen, maybe, or heard at least, um, it is a multi-syllabic um, behavior. So the pups produce long vocal sequences where they have many different syllable types. And then they have like short, very short silent intervals, and then they go again. And those those babbling bouts are produced throughout the entire day, from from morning uh, until um, sunset. And the average duration of those vocal practice bouts is seven minutes, and it can last up to forty three minutes. And this is so crazy when you think about it, because normally like bad vocalizations are quite short, right? They're like songs have maybe a duration of couple of seconds and that's it. But um, to practice and to produce vocalizations for like so such a long time, this is epic. And I I tend to um, try to find a, a, a comparison for humans. And I, I always end up with like, maybe it's like equivalent, like us singing two operas one after the other, like, you know, a lot of effort and uh, a lot of energy going into that um, behavior. So we have to take a little detour to human infants now because we are talking about babbling and babbling, of course, is um, very much related to speech acquisition in infants. Here you see a simplified timeline of um, speech acquisition in infants. So soon after birth, infants start with a so-called pre-canonical babbling. So they produce a lot of sounds which are clearly non-speech sounds. So they produce coos or raspberries. And it's probably mostly to play around with your vocal apparatus and try to find out how to produce certain things, how to control pitch or um, loudness, for example. And then around six to seven months, they start to produce so-called canonical babbling. And that's when the first mature speech sounds um, emerge in this babbling behavior. So mature speech sounds are the syllables or the sounds that we recognize as mature syllables of our adult language. So. When you have a child, you listen to him and he goes da 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 da. Then you know that da is actually a syllable which you recognize and it's a syllable which is later used in, in words. Um, and around one year of age, infants then produce first words. And irrespective of the language that you are learning as a child and irrespective of the culture you're growing up in, at some point you will enter this babbling or this practice phase and therefore, there are certain features that universally describe and characterize this babbling behavior, like this very early onset during infancy, this mixture of clearly non-speech sounds with mature speech sounds at some point, um, very salient features like repetitiveness and rhythmicity, um, and of course, what I said in the beginning, this universality. 
The vocal ontogeny in Zakopterix pliniata is defined um, by clear phases. So first we have the so-called pre-babbling phase. During this time, the pup only produces innate vocalizations and mainly it's producing the isolation call. That's how this call, this multisyllabic vocalization looks like. Um, in uh, what we know about this vocalization is that it encodes an individual signature, which actually allows mothers to discriminate between their own and other pups, something which was confirmed by playbacks, which Miriam uh, did during her PhD. Um, this um, vocalization also encodes a so-called group signature, meaning that the pups from the same social groups are more similar to one another compared to pups from other groups. And then during my PhD, we also found out that a part, namely this element here, is encoding an H signature. And um, beside producing this multisyllabic vocalization with multiple um, information encoded, the pups are really attached all the time to the belly of the mother, like here in this photo. So um, they are probably mostly nursing or sleeping, we don't know. Not only sometimes the pup will arch his head back and then produce a suite of this um, isolation calls. And then roughly around two and a half weeks of age, the pups will become more independent, meaning that when you look at the photo here on the right side, meaning that the uh, female shakes the the, the infant off, as you have seen in the first video, and then the, the, the pup will perch next to its mom. And at this time, this babbling or this vocal practice behavior starts. And as, I've, as I have said before, and as you have seen in the video, it's a multisyllabic behavior where you have adult-like syllables, so syllables that I really recognize as being part of the later adult vocal repertoire, but there are also exclusive juvenile syllables, meaning that they're only produced during babbling and only by pups. And then after eight to 10 weeks, uh, this babbling phase stops, the pups are weaned. And from this moment on, they will only produce adult vocalizations or the adult vocal repertoire, meaning that females only produce very few vocalizations and the courtship and the territorial song are only produced by adult males. So of course, uh, the question which was um, um, straightforward during my PhD was whether this behavior, this pup vocal practice behavior was characterized by the same features that are actually found in human infant babbling. And I was lucky enough to work with wild bats. So that's how we approach most of our questions when studying behavior and communication in these bat species. So we take great care and time to habituate the bats to our presence. Um, and after a while, they are totally fine with us being in their vicinity, meaning that we can approach their day roosts up to two meters. So I was um, observing pups from different colonies, from two different populations, one in Costa Rica and one in, in Panama over consecutive years. And I was um, basically accompanying the pups from, their, from the day they were born until the day they were weaned, so for three to four months. And I was sitting in front of the trees with my camera, with my acoustic microphone, recording their, their vocal behavior and um, uh, yeah, general behavior also between mother and pup. And we also banned most adult individuals. So we put um, plastic rings on their forearms and this banding method is established for decades and it is not in any way um, uh, uh, impacting the behavior or the well-being of the bats. So after taking or collecting the data, the acoustic data, I went back to the lab and then I, uh, had many, many hours in front of the computer where I was going through this um, vocal recordings of the pup babbling throughout the entire ontogeny to see whether I can um, find out whether these same features that are present in infant babbling are also present in pup babbling. And it turned out actually that, yes, the same features that are present in human infant babbling are also um, uh, characteristic of pup babbling. And what I find most intriguing here is the point of universality, because 
you probably remember from before, I was saying that females, when they are adults, they only produce few vocalizations from the adult vocal repertoire. They don't produce the territorial song. They don't produce the courtship song. Nevertheless, as pups, there are no differences whatsoever in the different um, babbling features between a male and female pups. So the females are putting the same effort into the learning, into the babbling, and they learn the same syllables as male pups do. So the functions of babbling, both in human and in pups, are probably multiple functions. So, of course, it is probably a behavior to practice the syllables that we learn through vocal imitation. Um, but I'm certain that it is also vocal play, that, that it is just playing around with your vocal apparatus, finding out what you can do and what not. And maybe it's also a way of fitness signaling to your caretaker or to your, to your mother in the case of the pups, showing that when you vocalize a lot and for a long time, that we're worth to put a lot of care into you. And um, although for us humans, this babbling seems so normal, it is quite rarely observed in the animal kingdom. So besides um, the greater second bat, we know that of course, songbirds have this behavior which is reminiscent of babbling, but there it is restricted to males. But I'm sure that when we have more research about female songbirds, females that sing and females that learn how to sing, they will probably also use the same mechanisms to learn their songs. And then there was a study in 2022 showing that also parrot, a parrot species in Venezuela is babbling. Um, interestingly, they only babble for one week, and this seems to be enough. And then we have a primate, the common marmoset, which is also known to have um, a conspicuous um, vocal behavior, which is reminiscent of babbling. Here, the only difference is that the common marmoset is, um, uh, let's say, a restricted vocal learner. So they have this call convergence. So they have innate vocalizations, but they can um, modify them based on, on acoustic input. So a lot of questions, you don't have to read them, but just to show you that this research um, gave rise to a lot of, lot of questions, which I aim to, to answer in the future. So one of the most pressing ones is why do female pups learn actually the same way than, than males do, right? And um, I said before that in a colony, you have often several tutors. So from whom are you learning and why, or are you learning from all of them? And I would like to go deeper into the learning abilities of the, the, the single pups to see if there are differences and if these differences in learning abilities, do they mirror individual quality? And I'm sure that other parts of the vocal repertoire also learned. What I didn't say is that, um, or didn't mention is that many syllables of the courtship song are actually not present in this pup babbling. Um, but I'm sure that they are also learned, but when do they acquire that? And when do they practice that? Do they have to practice that at all? And then of course, uh, one, of, uh, one question which is really interesting to me, are they even able to learn heterospecific vocalizations? We don't know. Um, and uh, I want to go further into the babbling to know whether this is really a prerequisite for vocal learning, if it is an intrinsically rewarding behavior, which I really think it is. And I think this overall babbling behavior, which is a uh, indication of ongoing learning process during ontogeny, is also a great chance to study the neural substrates of vocal learning. So what I started to do during my PhD, starting to look into genes which are also speech relevant genes and to look into their functional roles during babbling. So during the second part of my talk, I would like to dive more in, a little bit into the social environment and social feedback because for most forms of learning, social feedback matters and especially for vocal development and learning. So in zebra finches, it has been shown that of course, aside from the auditory input that you need to learn the song, um, females also play a decisive role when it comes to learning. So studies were showing that females produce a certain behavior, a wing puff, and when they put, when they do that contingently to the learning process or the singing, learning pupil, the song learning success increases. And it was also shown that the males produce actually a so-called pupil-directed song, which is simpler 
in tempo and has less um, um, notes or syllables in it. And the pupils actually prefer to listen to that simplified song. So kind of fatheries in these birds. And in cowbirds, the females also play an important role. So um, the young male sings different song types and depending on which song types get a behavioral response, also again, a wing behavior of the female, the males decides which song types they're going to retain and which ones they're going to discard before they crystallize. And in the common marmoset, um, many, many studies have shown convincingly that parental contingent feedback actually influences the maturation of one specific call, the fee call. And of course, in humans, we have plenty of studies showing that social feedback actually matters for speech acquisition, um, not only when it's given in a contingent vocal interaction, interactive way, but also through behaviors like touching or smiling the infant, smiling at the infant. And interestingly, um, this social feedback also influences factors like motivation and arousal in the child, factors that are known to be important for learning processes. So um, the difference here, again, we have the vocal production learners that are capable of vocal imitation, and then the marmosets that are um, on the level of call convergence. So again, just a little reminder, we have this territorial song, which is learned through vocal imitation. And as you know, the males produce a song, the pups hear it, and then they start to learn it through this babbling behavior. And I started to be interested in the social environment because the social environment of a pup is a whole colony, right? And then you have the different males which provide the auditory input. But apart from this auditory input, the males don't interact very much with the pups. Um, so they represent the indirect social environment. However, the mothers do interact with their pups and they do it in different modalities. So during my PhD, we found out that females actually are producing a so-called directive call and they can produce it while the pup is babbling. And we could show that females actually change the timbre of their voice depending on whether they are addressing their pup compared to when they are addressing other adult bats. But what females do most frequently while the pup is babbling, they have a suite of different behavioral displays. So for example, they touch the pup with a folded wing, they um, perform short flights towards the pup or a little bit away from the pup. They do this hover flight, the same that you have seen um, in the courtship behavior video. And um, also very often they crawl towards or away from the pup or uh, round um, of the pup while the pup is babbling. So again, I wanted to show you a short video. Um, the quality is not the best. It was a very humid day in the tropical forest. But I hope you can see a little bit um, uh, the, of how this interactive behavior looks like. So we have the pup and the pup is babbling and the female is showing different behavioral displays. So the pup as well, but you can concentrate on the female. So here the pup is vocalizing, he touches the mom, the mom will do this circle. They do that a lot, crawling around the pup. And then this would be an example of a short flight. So the female just flew to the other side of the roost and the pup usually then follows. This is like an imitation for the pup. And now we will see how the mother again changed her position. And now the pup will try a hover flight, but this is like a very uh, meager hover flight. It was just still learning how to produce that. And so all these interactions are occurring during this babbling behavior. And to put that a little bit into context, so these this behaviors, especially from the mom, are really affiliative behaviors. And if the mother does, has, has no intention to interact with the pup, she doesn't want to do anything, then she really clearly can show that. So what I have seen also is that a pup that is babbling and approaching the mom and starting to interact, and the mother will just simply lift her folded wing and really hit the pup with the wrist, and then the pup will stop babbling. So um, all these interactions which are occurring here in this video are affiliative um, interactions. So what I was doing also as part of my PhD is was looking into these behavioral interactions. Um, I um, quantified them 
And I also looked into the acoustic recordings and um, yeah, the babbling behavior of the pups. And unfortunately, <laughs> I cannot say too much about uh, these results here because a part um, um, of the analysis are still ongoing. And we also hope to, yeah, um, resubmit these um, findings again soon. But what we find is that um, females most likely influence different, different aspects of vocal practice and learning behavior. So mostly through behavioral interactions, as it was the case in other um, vocal learning species as well. And I still have to figure out in the future if and how this vocal directive calls of the mothers is somehow related to the babbling and learning. And again, this also uh, gave rise to a lot of questions. Um, during my postdoc now, I um, during another experiment that I performed, I realized that females might even produce more um, another vocalization type um, as a feedback signal to your babbling. So that's something I want to explore in the future. And I think it would be super interesting to see if um, hormones play a role in the mother. So I think that looking into oxytocin and dopamine could be very interesting. And then also in humans, we know that mature speech sounds more, uh, more likely elicit um, contingent response from parents rather than not mature speech sounds. And I would like to explore which parts of babbling actually elicit maternal feedback. And during my time in the forest, I also realized that females are quite different in their interactivities. So I would like if the maternal personality influences learning success and the most overarching question, whether this impact of a social, early social environment impacts later success in life. So this babbling behavior is a rarely observed behavior, as you now know. Um, it has only been described in a couple of species. And so far, the greater sackling bat is the only other mammalian species that is capable of vocal imitation and has this babbling behavior. And also, it seems that the social feedback seems to impact learning and ontogenetic processes. And that's why I think that it is a especially promising candidate to study exactly these questions. Yeah, and with that, I would like to close my talk. I think that one of the main take home messages, at least for me, is that um, to study in-depth questions about complex behaviors and complex vocal communication, I think it is really, really crucial to do long-term studies if possible. Um, and also, if possible, study wild bats in the natural environment, because of course you need also controlled experiments in the lab, but for understanding, especially the social environment, it is really crucial that you also go outside and try to figure out the behavior or observe the behavior in nature. And with that, I would like to thank a lot of people. First of all, my two students, which um, so Nora and Sarah, who were helping me during my PhD to collect data and analyze data. The beautiful bad drawings were uh, done by Tina Mum. I would like to especially thank Rachel Page. She is the founder and leader of the Bad Lab in Gamboa. She was always supporting me and my research and Greg Cohen, um, the Bad Lab manager from said lab. He is also amazing and always finds a solution to every problem. Um, you for listening to me, um, Bats Without Borders for inviting me to give this talk. And last but not least, my, um, or the amazing, most amazing and hottest lab ever um, where I can be part of um, since a while now. And if you want to talk about vocal communication in bats, if you found another species that is babbling, which would be super cool, please feel free to contact me. I'm always open for talking about bats, social communication, or for cooperation projects. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for a brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant presentation. Um, so um, I've got a question from Guliana, who said, amazing presentation, Ahana. Um, she said she loves uh, oh, sorry, just up. Um, species. Do you think that other species of the family have these same behaviors? 
So um, from the embalanurid bats, we know that, for example, the sister species is not babbling at all. And they also, so as far as we know, they do not vocally learn. Um, and there is another species, Rinconicteris naso, who might have a similar um, pup practice behavior, but we still don't know enough about it, about it. And the other species, we would love to see that because it would be super interesting to compare it in, within the family. But uh, the most species um, of this family are super hard to observe and to get any vocalizations or behavioral recordings of. Yeah, and I can imagine also, I, I think, you know, doing your recordings, you know, in the wild, are, you know, is, is a fantastic opportunity, but also probably brings with it a lot of complexity as well. And, and does, so does it take quite a while to, to get the bats a bit kind of used to you and the equipment? Have you found it differs between different species and some are kind of a little bit easier to habituate or? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, uh, Sacopteryx bilineata is nice because it, it takes like two weeks mostly to really habituate it, habituate yourself to the bats. But I think maybe because they are um, so happy to roost in, in structures that are man-made and they are anyway often roosting close to humans, this might help. Um, and I have definitely um, habituated other bat species as well. And some take much longer, much, much longer than Sacopter Spiliniata, yes. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Um, so just to say, if anybody wants to put questions in the chat, or also feel free to to um, left, you know, raise your hand, and we can, uh, if you'd prefer to ask in person, that's absolutely fine. And um, so I just had a question about because certainly for us in Southern Africa, we have 130 plus species, and ID is really really tough um, for you know kind of just recording echolocation calls. But I know that there's obviously been a big push certainly in Europe with more social calls, and I was just wondering if you know you have any sort of insights into kind of how social calls could potentially you know help to identify species too um or is that also probably even more complicated <laughs> no no this is a very good question and it's actually a very valid point because um uh we also know so i know from from species that work in germany that some families it's super hard to tell them apart or to identify them based on a collocation calls because all the peak uh Frequencies are basically the same or overlapping in range. And social calls can actually help sometimes um, to identify certain bad species because they can be different. But I think we need a lot more information. So whenever there is the possibility to have social vocal recordings best um, related to a context, um, that is that is great. And I think I think social calls are a potential way to help ID species that are not possible based on echolocation calls. Yes. Yeah, fair enough. That's, and uh, yeah, so the, um, so we've got lots of, um, and uh, Ruth will send you all the comments after because it's always nice to read them <laughs> but when you have a bit more time, but um, we've got lots of um, fantastic comments as, as well. Um, so we have a question um, about, um, I have a question in, um, Cecopteryx valentia, probably, um, um, are the males courting the females for the entire year? If not, when do you think the pup, pups learn the courtship uh, songs? Yeah, I love this question. It's excellent. Um, uh, yeah, they they do court the females, um, but in a, a year round, but in a sort of reduced way. So what the males do is every morning when the females come back from foraging and they come back to the to the to the colony or and to the day roost, the males will briefly hover in front of each female and greet them so this is kind of there are aspects of the the courtship behavior but the full-blown courtship behavior which where the, the the males really are trying to court the female for 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 a long time even for an hour this happens um during the mating season which starts in in panama and costa rica in in november and goes mostly uh, until end of january and um i was thinking a lot about <laughs> when do males could learn that? And the only time period which I could imagine if they learn the courtship song is between the time point when the, 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 the males are weaned and before they become a territorial male, right? Because normally, so the tenure track for a territorial male is about two years. And normally when the pups are born, 
they have one or two years before they become a, a territorial male. So don't, they, they won't normally become a territorial male in the same year they are born. So maybe there is a, this time window, which is very brief, um, where they can listen to the vocalizations. And if they are no territorial male during the first mating season, they will be exposed to the full-blown courtship. And maybe that's the time when they hear. And this, this, this syllables and this song. And I don't know how much they need to practice that. Um, if they go maybe to another place to practice that quietly, it could be that during the night they sit somewhere and practice that because the, the, the Kurchik song in contrast to the territorial song is not, um, uh, it's not audible over uh, such a range, right? It's very high in frequency. It's, it's, it's rather, um, fainter. So maybe the, the males could so sit somewhere and quietly practice that. I don't know but I would love to explore that in the future. Excellent. So we probably have time for one more quick question. If, um, oh, sorry, uh, Phil has got a question. Sorry, I just I missed that one. Um, so um, is the harmonic uh, context one of the parameters um, that are tweaked um, to encoded groups or for individual ID? I noticed many um, extremely harmonic rich uh, content um, then occasionally purer tones. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, when we want to um, uh, investigate if there is an individual signature or a, a group signature, we mostly um, only focus on the fundamental frequency because as you have noticed, um, or you probably know is the, the, the number of harmonics that you record really depend on the loudness of the call, on the directionality of your microphone, how, how close you are. So, um, we usually take the harmonic that is um, best depicted in the spectrogram, and then we extract all the features for individual signatures from this harmonic, and then we calculate it down to the, to the fundamental frequency for comparison reasons. Um, what we have started to do now is um, to extract so-called linear capstrel coefficients, so vocal features. They say something about the timbre of a voice, and when we do extract them, we usually extract them over all harmonics. So we, we for, for comparison reasons, we take calls that have the same number of harmonics, let's say three or four, and then we extract these features over the entire harmonics. I hope this answers the question. Thank you very much. And uh, Bismarck has his hand up. So he's, I know, based in Germany, but he's, he's from Ghana. So Bismarck, please. I, I, I'm afraid I can't hear you. I don't know if it's the same for the others. Yeah, I can't hear. Still not. No. Biz, Bismarck, can you maybe try unmuting yourself again? It looks like you're unmuted. Ah, yeah, now try again. Let's see if that works. Uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you. But maybe you type in your question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Pop it, yeah. If you want to pop your question in the chat, uh, that that would be great. Um, and Cloud has also said, uh, "What a really interesting study." So Cloud is from DRC. So Bismarck's question: um, Do the male pups usually combine the territorial song of several males um, to produce their unique call? Great question. Very good question. I I don't know. I can't answer that, but it is one of my future projects. I would like to know um when the pups are in a colony where they have several territorial males that are singing i would like to know if they choose a tutor or if they learn kind of like from all the tutors um and based on what factors do they choose to learn from so i don't know maybe in a couple of years i can answer your question Great. Well, thank you very much um, for that. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming along. A big welcome again to those of you who are um, new 
Um, and then Bismarck just said that's really super interesting. So, um, and a huge thank you uh, to Ahana. Thank you very, very much for, for coming along. Um, and we'll also circulate um, the, the contact details, but there will be a few people asked about the video. This will be on the YouTube channel um, later on this week. And we also will share it in, on social media. So please do let other people know. Um, but also uh, do get in touch with Ahana if you're interested. And certainly those yes. of you based in Africa, we would love to get uh, more collaborations going. So please do get in touch and um if you, you you just get in touch with us if you didn't catch the the details and we'll be very happy to pass it on um, but thank you very very much uh, for coming along we really appreciate it thank you very much again for inviting me and thank you all for your interest and your time and your questions and yeah as um as said before please contact me i would be super happy <laughs>